Jiram Pimbira. No rain had fallen near Temba's village for a long time. The river had almost dried up and the soil in the fields had turned to dust so that the people could not sow their corn until the rains came. Temba's mother and sisters sat idle all day, with no work to do on the farms, and very little food to cook, as last year's stock of grain was nearly finished. They looked so sad that Temba decided he must do something to help them. So he called to some boys nearby and asked them, Will you come with me over the hills to search for water? and perhaps bring back some meat from the hunt? Yes, they replied. Our mothers and sisters are crying with hunger too. We will come with you. Off they went, with their bows and arrows and hunting knives, making their way to the south, where they hoped to find food and water. There were three other boys with Temba, and the first day they traveled from sunrise to sunset, seeing nothing but dry ground and feeling nothing but the heat of the sun beating down on their backs. When night came they sheltered as best they could in a small rocky cave at the foot of a hill, and the next day they set off again as soon as it was light enough to see their path. When the second night had come and gone, the other boys began to get angry with Temba. Why did you bring us here to starve? They asked. We have found no food or water and would have been better off at home. Just come with me for one more day, beg Temba, and then perhaps we shall be luckier. I think I can see some trees in the distance, and we may soon reach a forest and be able to shoot some game there. The boys followed him reluctantly, grumbling all the time, and when at last they reached the forest, they immediately began to hunt for animals. Temba went one way and the three boys went another, and great was their joy when they managed to kill a wild pig, which they immediately prepared for cooking. Temba joined them a little later, with a small porcupine which he too prepared for the pot, and presently they all sat down to eat the first good meal they had had for several days. Unfortunately hunger had made Temba's companions greedy, and they refused to share any of the pork with Temba, although his catch afforded him only a few mouthfuls of meat. You led us to this barren place, they said, so you must go hungry. We need all the meat we have cooked for ourselves. Temba was angry and reached forward to seize the few remaining pieces of pork left over from the boy's good meal but they would not let him have them and set upon him and beat him mercilessly. As they were three to one, Temba was soon overcome and lay helpless while the boys decided what to do next. Let's leave him here, said the oldest. We shall only be punished if we take him back to the village and the people see how we have beaten him. The others agreed with him and, leaving Temba on the ground where he had fallen, the cowardly boys hurried away in another direction, hoping to find food and water elsewhere. When Temba came to himself he could not at first remember what had happened. But gradually his senses returned, and he realized that his so-called friends had left him alone to die in the forest. Slowly and painfully he sat up and gingerly felt his aching limbs, discovering that although he was badly bruised, there were no bones broken. He looked at the place where the fire had been burning the night before and was delighted to find that in their hurry to get away the boys had forgotten to take the meat with them. Temba gradually eased his sore body over toward the food, and was surprised to see a rat had got there first and was nibbling away at the meat. Without thinking Temba reached for a piece of firewood and was about to kill the animal with a blow. But the little creature sat up on its hind legs and begged so pathetically for its life that Temba laughingly dropped the stick, and said, I expect you're just as hungry as I am. Finish your meal and then run away, oh rat. The animal snatched a few more mouthfuls and then disappeared into the undergrowth with a grateful squeak. Now Temba was able to eat and began to feel better. He was just about to put the last piece of meat into his mouth when he noticed a fluttering in the tree above him, and a lean-looking hawk flew down to the ground, its hungry eyes fastened on the food which Temba held in his hand. So you're starving too, said Temba. This last piece won't make much difference to me. You may have it and he threw the meat to the hawk, who snatched it up in his beak, with a loud cry and flew happily away. All day long Temba rested in the shade of the forest, feeling too stiff and sore to move away, and certainly in no condition to go hunting. When evening came he began to feel very hungry again, and decided to make a little trap with sticks and vines. This was the only way he could catch something for his breakfast, as he still felt too ill to stride through the forest with his bow. It seemed a long time until morning, but at last the sun began to rise and the forest came to life again. Temba found he could stand up and took a few faltering steps toward the trap he had made, hoping to find something for breakfast in it. 
what a surprise he had when he found he had caught not an animal, but a little old man, scarcely as big as Temba's yam brother. Oh sir! I am sorry, exclaimed Temba, hastily untying the vines and releasing the trap. I hope to catch an animal for my breakfast. I didn't mean to catch you. Have you brought no food with you into this forest? Asked the little man. Surely a good traveler always carries something with him to eat on the journey? So Temba told him how he had come away from his village to find food for his mother and sisters, and how his companions had set on him and left him to die in the forest. Would you like something to eat now? Asked the man. Oh yes, please. Answered Temba, although he could see that the little man carried nothing with him and wondered whether he was teasing him. Reaching into his torn, shabby tunic the old man brought out two small bones, and held them toward Temba with a smile. Temba's hopes faded, for the bones had obviously been picked clean of meat months ago, but he said nothing. Take these bones and throw them onto the ground, saying Jirim Pimbira, and ask for the food you want, commanded. The little man. Still unbelieving, Temba took the bones, and in a half-hearted way he threw them on the ground, saying, Jirim Pimbira. Bring me some porridge. Immediately a calabash of bot porridge appeared at Temba's feet, and, after pausing to thank the old man, Temba sat down and ate a hearty meal. Thank you, he said at last. That is the first good meal I have had for a long time. The old man bent down and picked up the bones. Then he handed them to Temba. Take these, my boy, he said. They will be of more use to you than to me, I am very old and will not live much longer and I have no son to give these bones to. As long as you remember the magic word Jirim Pimbira the bones will bring you anything you want, food, clothes, huts or cattle. Temba thanked the old man profusely, but he said he wanted no thanks and slowly hobbled away until he disappeared into the forest. Temba felt much stronger now and made his way to the open land on the edge of the forest, determined to try out his magic bones, throwing them high into the air, so that they landed on a clear patch of grass, he cried, Jirim Pimbira. Build me a village. Immediately a village sprang up, complete with people, goats and chickens, and with a strong fence around it to keep out wild animals. The first thing Temba did was to pick up the magic bones which still lay on the grass, and tuck them into his loincloth. Then he walked about talking to the people, who did not seem at all surprised to be there, and who called him their chief. Temba looked down at his ragged hunting clothes and decided to ask the bones for something better, just beyond the edge of the village, he bid behind a tree and threw the bones. Jirim Pimbira. He cried, bring me the clothes of a chief. Suddenly he found himself dressed in heavy blue embroidered robes, with a good-sized pocket where he hid the magic bones for safety. All day long he strolled about the village, eating and drinking his fill, and being treated with great respect by all the villagers, who did not seem to notice how young he was. When night came he was given the biggest hut to sleep in, and found a comfortable mat and blanket waiting for him there. Very soon I must go back to my own village, he said to himself, and use these bones to help feed the people there. Now it happened that the three lads who had ill-treated Temba had lost their way after they left him, and had been wandering around in circles, looking for some landmark they could recognize, but finding none. When night came they huddled together in the shelter of some bushes, and were just falling asleep when one thought he saw a light in the distance and roused his companions. Look over there! He cried. That is a fire burning. They rubbed their eyes and peered into the darkness. And there's another light, said one of the boys. It's moving. Perhaps there is a village over there. As soon as it is light we must go and see. Now although the boys did not realize it, they were only a few miles from the place where they had left Temba and it was the lights of his magic village that they could see. When morning came, they hurried across the bush toward the place where they had seen the fires, and sure enough, they found the village. As they approached it they saw the chief standing at the entrance, so they knelt down in front of him and begged for food and shelter. Temba called to some women, and told them to bring food and drink for the boys, and when they had finished eating, he said, Don't you recognize me? I am Temba, whom you left for dead in the forest. When they heard this, they begged his forgiveness, and said they would never do such a wicked thing again. 
so Temba placed a hut at their disposal and told them to go and rest. He said they could all travel with him back to their home the next day, when they felt stronger. After the boys had slept for an hour or two they began talking to each other. How can Temba be chief of this village, and where did he get the fine clothes he is wearing? They said. There must be magic about, let us creep up to his hut and see what he is doing. Suggested one of them. The sun was high in the sky and everyone in the village was resting during the afternoon heat, so the boys were able to steal out of their hut without being noticed. Looking hastily around them for the largest hut, they tiptoed toward it and were soon peeping through a crack in the doorway. At first they could see nothing as it was so dark inside, but presently they made out the figure of someone lying on a mat asleep. For a long time they waited, hoping that Tembo would wake up and give them some clue to his sudden wealth, and presently he did. Sitting up and stretching his arms above his head, Temba said to himself, how I would enjoy some food now. Where are my magic bones? The boys held their breath as they watched Temba take something from his pocket, throw it on the ground and say, Jirimpimbira. Bring me some soup and beans. A calabash of food immediately appeared beside the bed, but just as Temba was about to eat it, a dog began to bark in a nearby hut, and the boys scuttled back to their hut afraid of being found out. Well? exclaimed the oldest lad. Now we know where he got his wealth. All we have to do is to steal those magic bones, and then we can be rich too. Now Temba did not know what the boys had seen, and that night he left the magic bones in the pocket of his gown, which he hung on a wooden peg sticking out from the rafters. In the middle of the night the boys left their hut and crept again to Temba's where they silently lifted down his gown and stole the bones from his pocket. Quick! Away from the village, said the oldest boy, and the three of them ran until they could run no farther. Now we can have a village of our own, they said, and, throwing the bones down where they stood, they cried, Jirimpimbira. Bring us a village. Then before their eyes a village rose from the ground, with huts full of sleeping people, and with tethered animals in the compound waiting for morning. We must destroy Temba's village, so that he cannot send his people after us, said one of the lads. So they threw the bones on the ground and shouted, Jirimpimbira. Let Temba's village be destroyed. When Temba awoke in the morning, he was lying on the bare ground in his old loincloth, his village and fine clothes had disappeared and so had his three companions. Alas! He cried. They have stolen my magic bones. What shall I do? A shrill squeaking caught his attention, and, looking down beside him, Temba saw a grey rat. What is the matter? Asked the rat. You helped me the other day so now I must try to help you. No one can help me. Exclaimed Temba. I had two magic bones which brought me all I asked for, but now they have been stolen by my companions, and I do not know where to look for them. At that moment a hawk, which had been circling above Temba's head, alighted at his feet. I know where your companions have gone, said the hawk. A new village has sprung up on the other side of that hill and the three boys are there. Thank you, said Temba. But how can I get my magic bones back from them? They will see me coming and will hide the bones and most likely give me another beating. The rat and I will get them, replied the hawk. You helped us and now we will help you. Go across the plain and hide at the foot of the hill. You can see the village from there, and if you wait a while we will bring your magic bones. Temba hurried toward the place that the hawk had pointed out to him, and, hiding himself in the grass, he waited. Meanwhile the rat had gone on ahead and crawled unnoticed into the village where he searched in every hut for the magic bones. At last he found them, where Temba's companions had hidden them, lying on top of a hut wall, under the thatch. Seizing them in his paws, the rat began his difficult journey back toward Temba. This time, however, he was not so fortunate, for one of the boys caught sight of him. He seized a stick and rushed toward the rat, and would have killed him immediately but the hawk flew down, flapping his wings in the boy's face. Then he picked up the rat in his claws and flew away. Over the village he flew, carrying the rat and the bones with him, until he reached Temba who was lying in wait. Thank you thank you! said Temba, as he picked up the bones. How can I reward you? I would like some nuts, replied the rat and I am very fond of meat, answered the hawk. Jirim Pimbira. 
Bring me some nuts and meat, said Temba, throwing the bones on the ground. Then the hawk and rat had the best meal of their lives. You should ask the bones to destroy that village before the people can harm you, suggested the rat. So Temba once more threw down the bones and called, Jirimpimbira. Let the village be destroyed. Saying goodbye to the hawk and the rat, Temba began his journey home, carefully carrying the bones, and keeping a sharp lookout for anyone who might try to steal them again. When at last he reached home his mother and sisters were almost dying of hunger and were disgusted with him when he showed them what he had brought back. Bones. They said. Dry bones. We cannot even make soup with such poor things. But with a cry of jeer and Pimbira Temba soon had plenty for his family and friends to eat, and a new village to replace the one that had grown shabby with neglect. And when, a few days later, his three companions came shamefacedly into the compound, begging for food, Temba made them promise never to steal from him again. Then he gave them all they wanted to eat and drink, and a fine new hut to live in, while the bones provided food for everybody until the rains came and the men were able to plant seeds on their farms once more.